Is your self-talk hurting your conversations with others and your conversations with God? Brady Boyd is our guest this week discussing how we can restore healthy communication and how we think, talk, and pray. It's all in episode 79 of the Church Leaders Podcast. Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping you lead better every day. And now here's your host, podcasting from scenic Colorado Springs, Colorado, Andrew Hess. Well, thanks for tuning in to episode 79 of the Church Leaders Podcast. I'm Andrew Hess, your host, and this week we're talking with Brady Boyd. Brady Boyd is the senior pastor of New Life Church in Colorado Springs, Colorado. He's also the author of several books, including Addicted to Busy and Fear No Evil. He also is a regular contributor to churchleaders.com. We talked to Brady about how Jesus teaches us that the health of a conversation is only as vibrant as the health of one's interactions with God. And now, here's our conversation with Brady Boyd. Well, Brady, welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast. It's uh, great to have you on the show today. Hey, Andrew. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Brady, you're the pastor of New Life uh, here in Colorado Springs, where we are as well. Tell us about uh, something that's happening at New Life that you're excited about right now. Okay. Well, this is uh, the timing of your question could not be better because yesterday at church, I just announced our a merger of sorts that we are undergoing with the largest Hispanic Latino church in our city, uh, Nueva Vida, has about 500 members, uh, a church here in our city. And on the night of the election, so on the Tuesday night when the entire country was nervously awaiting the results of the election, our elders were meeting to sign a document that uh, finalized this merger with New Life Church and Nueva Vida, which obviously means new life in Spanish. And uh, it was a significant moment for us because at a moment where our country seems really divided, it was almost as if the Lord was giving us this opportunity to show the world that a mostly Spanish-speaking congregation, mostly first-generation immigrants, a church like that could be connected and real brotherhood and unity with a mostly white, mostly upper middle class church up in the north part of our city. So it was this beautiful uh, story and uh, of unity, of real Christian unity that could happen in a moment where our country seems to be more divided than ever. Wow, that is that is really cool. And how long ago did you begin working on that? Well, last fall I went there to speak on a Wednesday night and. I was telling my congregation yesterday that something happened in that Wednesday night service when I was at the church down there, way south of town. I mean, really, quite honestly, it's in a part of town that most people at New Life would never even go. I mean, we just never are there. And uh, I was down there speaking, and in the middle of that service, it was almost like the Lord just made it clear to me uh, that something was happening between our two churches. So it's been almost a year now, probably over a year of us talking about it, praying about it, working through all the details, because that's not something that just happens easily, you know, a merger uh, between two congregations. It, in fact, it's it's almost unheard of. It's just something that normally one church is in a crisis, you know, and the other church has to go in and rescue it. But in this case, the uh, Nueva Vida is flourishing. They're growing like crazy. They really, uh, in the truest sense, don't need us. They're, we're not rescuing them. We're not, uh, you know, we're not out there trying to help them. They're actually doing very well. It was just God saying it's time for the church to not be so separated in Colorado Springs. And so it's been that. I'm glad you asked the question because it was such a beautiful moment for our church yesterday. That's awesome. Yeah, it just sounds like, and that's, that's so healthy uh, when two churches that are doing well decide to work together uh, that we maybe can do more together than apart. Well, in, and I think one of the great scandals of our age is how splintered and divided, how separated the American church is from one another. And we have to do a better job of coming together, of uh, living life together, and putting aside some of the really, quite honestly, uh, their petty, minor differences in theology. Now, I know when we're talking about those differences in theology, they don't seem minor, and they seem important, but if we backed up and kind of you know, really got to 30,000 feet and looked at what's really dividing the American church, there's pretty minor things that are dividing us in some cases. And I just think there's more that we can do together than we can do apart, that's for sure. That's awesome. And I think that um, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about today is 
is co- this idea of conversations of of how yeah. we start these conversations, whether it's between churches or or even and as you've written our conversation with God and our conversation with ourselves. You have a new book. Tell us about kind of where the idea for this this book came out. Well, I um, I wrote the book Speak Life uh, about a year ago because I could. I looked ahead, and, and it didn't take much of a profit to see that our country was headed to one of the most divisive political seasons uh, probably in the last 30 or 40 years. And I'm, I'm very concerned about my congregation, about my family, about our city. Uh, you know, we're, we're living in Colorado. We're a swing state. We're, it seems like that Colorado is at the tip of the spear on a lot of the uh, weighty social issues that are facing our country. And so I wrote the book, Speak Life, as a way to prepare my congregation to have healthy dialogue. And so I, I didn't, you know, there's a lot of books out there about, you know, how to talk well and how to speak well and how to be more godly in our conversation. But I really was fascinated by the stories. I just began to ask the question, how did Jesus talk? That's not a question I'd really ever asked before, you know. I mean, I was paying attention to what Jesus said in the Bible, but I'd never asked the question, how did Jesus talk? until I went to Luke chapter 3 and Luke chapter 4, and there were these four conversations in those two chapters that jumped off the page at me, and it began the process of writing this book called Speak Life. And I got it into the hands of my church months before we voted, a couple of months ago, so that we could have uh, be better equipped to have better conversations, quite honestly. Mm, I love the idea for the book. And you start by talking about how we, we begin to work on our conversation with God, um, where kind of the, the secret to having a good conversation is, is starting with our, the running conversation we have with God. Kind of unpack that, you know, some of the things that you wanted to convey. Well, conversations are holy, and if we don't think that our words are holy, then we will misuse them. And the first place that we realize how holy our words are, are is in prayer that's when we discover that our words matter and that God, uh, and I don't know where everyone who's listening today, I don't know where their theology, if their theology will even allow them to believe this, but I am completely convinced that God wants to speak to us, that God is speaking to us. And so my theology, my understanding of the scriptures show this speaking God trying to get the attention of human beings from the beginning of the book all the way to the end God's trying to have a conversation with us and once we realize that our words are holy that our words matter that's when we can begin paying attention to how we use our words with other people but it starts in that holy place of prayer so it's in the holy moments of conversation with God that we have this uh, the first understanding of man, my words matter He's speaking life to me. I'm speaking life to him. And that should then carry over into all the other conversations that I talk about in the book. Yeah, and for the person who's listening who who may not be familiar with, you know, as you talk about listening to God speak, for the person that feels like, I, I don't know if God's ever spoken to me, how do you go about exploring that or, or diving into prayer at, in that way where we're, where we're listening? Well, I think most of us who are Christ followers can agree that the scriptures are holy, that the scriptures are God's attempt at communicating with us. I think most of us can wrestle that to the ground. So when I tell people about listening to God, I tell them to go to the Psalms, like those 150 Psalms that we have canonized for us in the scripture, to go to those Psalms and read one per day. You know, obviously when you get to Psalm 119, it might take you more than one day, but get to those Psalms and read one of those psalms out loud to yourself every day as a way of saying, God, I don't know if you're speaking to me, but I believe you've spoken through the scriptures. So I'm going to read this psalm out loud as a way of hearing God. And then what I tell my congregation to pray back to God what you just heard. And that will start a dialogue between you and God. So if you pray the psalm out loud, read it out loud, and then pray back what you think you heard, it will begin this process of training our minds and our imagination to have these conversations. And I think that's the way the Church has, quite honestly, discipled people for 2,000 years. And maybe the American Church, we've gotten away from just the discipline of reading the Scriptures out loud and praying them back. Mm, I love that. I know uh, that's why, I think it was why the message, one of the ideas that Eugene Peterson had behind the message was, 
getting people into the Psalms more. Like that's what how that, it all started. That's exactly right. And he, I've had actually, I know Eugene well enough to have had the personal conversation with him and his stories about writing the message version of the Bible for really drug addicts and people of the streets that were coming to Christ back in Baltimore. They didn't, they couldn't understand the traditional translations. And so he began rewriting familiar psalms like Psalm 21, Psalm 91, Psalm 51, all those traditional iconic psalms. He would rewrite them so that the people of the streets who were coming to Christ could understand them. And that was exactly why he did it, was to help them hear the psalms and hear the scriptures in their own language so that they could learn to pray. Mm. Powerful, right? Yeah, that is. I know for a lot of people that may be listening, they might be thinking, then how do we make sure that we protect ourselves um, if, if the enemy would try to, to speak and kind of confuse us? How do you dis- determine between when the enemy might be speaking and when God is speaking? Well, that, that is tricky, and I, what I tell people is the same. I use the analogy of when I started dating my wife. Now, we've been married 27 years, and we dated three years before that, so she's been my girlfriend for 30 years. But in the early days when I was dating my wife, and I don't want to, I'm going to sound like the old guy here, but this was before we had caller ID. So, you know, today you know who's calling you by, you can look at your phone and tell who's calling you. But back in the day, my old school days, when the phone rang, there was no way of knowing who was calling. So you had to listen and discern whose voice it was. Well, it took a few weeks for her to call me and I would, and, but over, you know, after we had gone on a couple of dates and had several conversations, she would call me on the phone and I would recognize her voice. I didn't ask, have to ask, who is this? So what I tell people is, again, this is why the scriptures are to anchor these conversations because the enemy's not going to come and, you know, confuse us with something that, that he, if he does confuse us, it'll be something outside the bounds of scripture. So I tell people, just start having the conversations with God And over time, you will learn to recognize his voice. If you're anchored in the scriptures and anchored in these prayerful psalms, God's voice will become more and more familiar to you, the same as uh, someone that you're becoming friends with. You will learn to recognize their voice when they call you. And it just takes time. And uh, I think sometimes we want to get it right and get it perfect before we start something. It's like riding a bike. You might fall off the bike. You might have a skinned knee, but... It's worth the effort to learn to ride a bike, and the same is hearing God's voice. Get into the game. Start talking to him. Start listening to him, and it'll make more sense to you along the way. It's not any more complicated than that, quite honestly. Mm. Yeah, I like that, the simplicity of that. Another conversation that you bring up is the conversation that we're always having with ourselves. And, <laughs> yeah. and so I think for a lot of people, that you know that may not be something they think about. Talk about how... You know how important it is for us to watch that conversation we're having with ourselves. Well, this is at, in Luke chapter four, verse eighteen. Jesus comes out of the wilderness, right, where he's had these conversations with the enemy, where he's been tempted, and he overcomes it through the written scriptures. But in verse eighteen of Luke chapter four, he goes into this Jewish synagogue and he sits down there and he opens up the holy scrolls of scripture, and he reads. Uh, it starts out, "The Spirit of the Lord is on me. You know, He's appointed me to bring good news to the poor." That, that iconic passage out of the book of Isaiah, he reads that out loud. Well, that prophecy is a prophecy about him, the Messiah. And so he's literally, it's positive affirmation of truth uh, that Jesus was quoting. So he's not quoting pie in the sky, hey, I hope I'm rich and skinny all my whole life, and I'm going to keep saying that till it's true. That's not what he was saying, and that's not what my book is about. I personally think that's bad theology. But what I do believe is helpful is to remind ourselves of what God says is true about us. And so what he was literally reading out loud in Luke chapter 4 was what was true about himself, what God had already said was true about him. Now here's what I, I think about ourselves. I think the most difficult person I will ever lead is myself. And I think most of us are not slowing down long enough to ask ourselves these questions. And so in the book, I talk about asking ourselves questions like, how am I doing? How are you doing, Brady? Like, you know, I know that sounds strange at first to think about that, but when was the last time you said, how am I really doing? How's things going? Am I healthy? Am I disciplined? Am I focused? You know, am I learning? I mean, most people my age, I turned 50 in a couple of months, most people that have reached my age have stopped learning, and I'm determined to not be a person that quits learning. I want to keep learning. 
I don't think I've got it all figured out. And so I want to, but you have to ask yourself that question every day. Am I learning? Am I growing as a human being? Am I at peace? Those are all great questions. And this dialogue that we have with ourselves allows us to coach ourselves. And the, quite honestly, the, the, the reason most of us are reckless with our words is because we're not coaching ourselves. Like, I, you know, I'm going into later today, this is an example, later today I'm going to have kind of a difficult conversation with someone on my team. Now, I know it's Monday, I probably shouldn't do this, but I have to. It's the only time on my calendar this week that I can have this conversation. So I'm coaching myself today. It's Monday. I preached twice at my church yesterday, so I'm a little tired. I have a Monday hangover today from all of the emotional energy that I gave out on Sunday. So Mondays are not the best day to have this conversation, but it's, it's, a, it's a necessary conversation. So I'm having to coach myself. Hey, take a deep breath. Be aware of your fatigue. Be aware of your emptiness. Brady, don't go into that conversation uh, without an awareness of these things. So what I'm saying in the book is learn to coach yourself. Learn to have these conversations before you go in to these one-on-one -on -one people conversations. Coach yourself first. Yeah, and it sounds like something that a lot of people might use uh, as they're journaling, like that they might write these things down. Is that something that, you know, that you've used in these times where you're kind of having this dialogue? Yeah, no, totally. You know what's replaced journaling today are Facebook and blogging and Twitter posts, and I'm, I'm afraid that's not. I think a lot of stuff that I read on social media should have been reserved for their private journal, mm. but instead we have this built-in platform of social media now where we have forgotten the discipline of processing our thoughts with words, what we do now is we process our words and we hit, we hit enter. We hit the enter button too quickly, the return button. And it goes on to social media when it should be held privately in our journals. You know, and I, I think fewer people are journaling and probably more people are posting on social media. And that's why we're seeing all this stream of consciousness, this anger, this vitriol that's coming out, especially during the political season. That should have been reserved for private thought, but they made it public. And now we all, it's almost like getting like a little kid spitting up on you. You know, they're a cute little kid, but they just spit up on you. Now you've got to deal with the mess. And I think a lot of that is happening on social media where they have, those are real thoughts and those are real emotions. They just should not be made public. They should be private. And I am, I'm tempted, like everyone else, to emote on social media. I just don't think social media is a healthy place to emote our very raw feelings that haven't been processed with prayer. Mm. Yeah, getting back to that, the discipline of discretion. Yes. And, yeah, so I love that. And you make a great connection in the book that healthy self-talk leads to healthier conversations with other people. And you kind of you kind of began to unpack that a little bit. But tell us how, how important it is. If people feel like, man, my conversations with other people always seem to be going poorly, how the answer might be, you need to have a better conversation with yourself. Well, I always ask myself this question, like today, like I just confessed to you. How will this be heard by the person I'm going to speak to? How would I hear it? So the question would be, how would I hear this on a Monday morning? How would I receive this information? And that's good, healthy self-talk. Because if you can't empathize with the person that you're dealing with, then you probably shouldn't have the conversation. So empathy is a powerful motivation. It's a powerful tool that we have at our disposal. So put yourself in their shoes empathize with them. Imagine yourself sitting there hearing this from someone that is your boss or someone that has, you know, the ability to hire and fire, to give you a raise or not. I mean, they, I know this, that as the senior pastor of a large staff, I have, I have authority and power that if I don't use that properly, I can harm people. And that's not what I want to do. And so putting myself in their position, remembering when I was a young man, when I was younger, I had to be corrected. How did I hear it? How did people do that well with me? How did people do that poorly with me? And all of those are, those are just good, healthy conversations to have with yourself. I think it, then it will cause me to be wiser and more discerning uh, and use more discretion when I have that conversation today with this person. Mm. Yeah, I think I mean, it, it, it reminds me a lot of preparing for an interview thinking through yeah. the things you want to talk about. But in that conversation, you have to be able to um, also turn, you know, and not just, you know, have these static questions. So you, you make the point of 
how important it is for us to see that our words can be healing. I thought that was really powerful. Talk about how we can heal others with our words. Well, this whole book is based on Proverbs twelve eighteen. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. So wisdom with words is a, is a recipe, according to the Bible, for healing. So wise words can heal people. Words of wisdom. So there has to be, obviously, the Holy Spirit has to be breathing on us for us to be wise, because very few of us are wise without the help of God and the Holy Spirit. That's just true. I mean, we need, if any among you need help, ask, and he will give you wisdom, that says in James. So I think it's important that we ask for wisdom when we speak. And when we ask for wisdom and speak wisdom, it literally has a chance to heal us right now. Think about right now the reckless words that we've heard during the political campaign from candidates, from media, from our friends on Facebook, how reckless people's words were. Uh, and we're, we're still today cleaning up the messes from those reckless words. You know, one of our candidates called um, uh, immigrants, you know, even rapists and murderers, and kind of put a blanket, you know, when Donald Trump said that about the entire uh, immigration uh, into the United States, that a lot of them were murderers and rapists. Well, that scarred. Uh, there was an article in our local paper today about uh, an immigrant who's here illegally. He admits that. He said but he's afraid now that he's, that he's going to be seen as a murderer and a rapist, yet he's been here 13 years working on construction sites. He has built the homes of many of the people in my part of town, but those words from Donald Trump put a scar on him. He's, he's very concerned that the white employers are now going to think that he's a murderer and a rapist. I'm just using that as an extreme example. I'm not trying to be political here. I'm just trying to give an example of these when we don't use our words properly, when we are reckless with our rhetoric. Rhetoric is harmful when they're not clothed in humility and kindness. And I, I, that's one example where we're going to have to clean that mess up. We're going to have to reassure these hard-working people, that not everyone in the white world of Colorado believes they're murderers and rapists, because I don't believe that. I think that's a pretty rare thing. Uh, and so we have to reassure hard-working people that we're not going to put labels on them based on some, something that a politician said about them. And that's an example that I would use as a pastor here in the city. I want to bring healing to our city. And I do that through wise words. Mm, I love that. And and talk to the person who may be listening to this, and, and something's in their heart where they know they've misspoken or, or maybe their words have hurt. What's the way to, when you know you've said something that maybe you shouldn't have, how can you begin to um, reconcile uh, and, and kind of... Well, first of all, we've all done that. I mean, we have all blown it, and we've all made mistakes. And the Lord gives us this beautiful opportunity to receive mercy and forgiveness and then we can turn around and ask people for mercy and forgiveness I, I think when we when we believe that we can be forgiven we're more prone to forgiving and asking for forgiveness and so I think the first step is do you believe that at your worst moment when you said the worst thing imaginable that God forgave you and if you believe that because I do believe that's true if you believe that you've been forgiven then we should go and ask others to forgive us too. And we should extend forgiveness to those who have hurt us. But it all starts with the belief that we have truly been forgiven. You can't give away what you don't have, right? And so if I have received oceans of forgiveness, I should be able to give a cup full of forgiveness to somebody else, right? And so I'm a visual person, so I'm always thinking about I'm swimming in oceans of grace. So therefore, when someone needs a cup of cold water, I should have plenty to give away. And uh, that helps me uh, with the process of asking for forgiveness and walking in forgiveness. Mm. I think it's so good. And it's, it's such a good reminder that, that we all do that all the time. And not only do we need to guard our words, but also be willing to admit when we've, when we've misspoken and uh, work to reconcile. Brady, thank you so much for, for being with us today and for uh, this book. I think it's something that every pastor uh, should be aware of and be reading, that they were really helping our people have these great conversations. Uh, thank you so much. Hey, I've enjoyed the conversation. I hope it's been helpful. <laughs> so have a great day, and I, I appreciate the time today. 
Well, thanks again to Brady Boyd for joining us this week as our special guest on the Church Leaders Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, take a few minutes to subscribe, rate, and review us in iTunes, and consider sending this episode to somebody that you know that might benefit from listening to it. Also, be sure to download the show notes for this episode at churchleaders.com forward slash podcast. In those show notes, we always include any resources mentioned in the show and then links to some of our guest top content on churchleaders.com. As always, if you have ideas for how we can improve this podcast or guests that you'd love to hear us talk to, email us at podcast at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next week. You've been listening to the Church Leaders Podcast. For articles, videos, and free resources that will help you lead better every day, visit our website, churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.